Welcome to Radio Free South Africa. This is your host, Karen Smith. Until midnight tonight, we will be having our last Silver Rush special of December. Anyone who donates $200 before midnight the, tonight or on any show will receive four 2015 uncirculated Silver Eagles and a survival and off-grid living library data disk. Our guest today is Amor Gerba from Million Stemmer for Steve. Translated, this means a million votes for Steve. Steve Hoffmeyer being the very well-known South African singer and activist. Welcome Amor. Um, thank you, Karen. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Amor, our overseas visitors, many of them don't know who Steve is or even what Million Stemmer for Steve means. So could you explain a little bit about who Steve is and what the organization is and what it is about and what we're intending to do with it? Okay, yes, I can do that already. Um, Steve Hofmeyer is a very well-known singer, as you said, in South Africa, um, but he's also an activist. And he has, in the past few years, really stood up to say that what's happening to us white people in South Africa is really not acceptable. The promises that has been made in 1994, when we became a democracy, um, has just not been lived up to. So in the beginning of the year, he, you know, people kept on asking him, Steve, you speak up for us, you stand up for us. When are you going into the politics? Because we really need you. And he said in a kind of a joke, well, you know, if I get a million people standing behind me, I will go into politics. And, you know, it was kind of like a joke for him. So in March this year, a group of us, ordinary people, came together and we kind of said, but, you know, we really need a, a voice that can pull all of us together um, and a one brand and say, this is us, enough is enough, listen to us, what's going on. And I contacted him and I said, Steve, you made this um, comment. Um, I don't know if you were serious or not, but this is what we want to do. We want to see how many people we can get to stand up and say, we are behind you. And he said, well, I'm all, you know, um, in South Africa, I need as many as possible people. We are only four and a half million white people in South Africa. So for me to stand up with 100 or 200 people, our voice is just not going to be heard. So yes, maybe I made a flip comment and said a million people, but go for it and see how many people we can get together that will say we are here. In other words, and test the waters. Yes, yes. So neither him or I really thought, you know, it's going to be a huge thing, but we thought maybe, you know, there are so many people who just don't have hope anymore. We're going to do it. We're going to see. We're going to just start a Facebook group and see how many people are feeling the way we're feeling. And on the 19th of March this year, I created the Facebook group called Million Stemmer for Steve or a Million Votes. It's, in other words, a million people supporting him. And within 24 hours, we stood on 90,000 people. Wow. Um, wow. Yes. So, so Steve and I were both kind of like, um, wow, we didn't expect this. We thought maybe 5,000, that would be great. And we've grown from there. We are currently over 200,000 people on Facebook. But we also realize that, especially in South Africa, there are quite a lot of people who don't have access to Facebook or to social media or to the Internet mm. because due to poverty. Yes. So we are also running a lot of paper-based um, petitions that people can sign as well as the SMS voting line. So on the SMS voting line, we're almost, we're standing close to 30,000 people who SMSed and voted through SMS. And we are slowly but surely picking up on the petition forms. Um, we, we go to a lot of um, gatherings like, like um, 
festivals and things like that and, and get people to sign our petitions there. So in total, we've got about 250,000 votes at this stage. Oh, wow. And that is enormous considering, as you say, how many million people do not have access to the Internet in South Africa. That, that is just incredible, Omar. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is why we really, we, we, we do understand that Facebook is, you know, a lot of people can go onto Facebook and they see something interesting and, you know, they, they might sign up and then they go again because, yeah, I'm not very interested in this. So Facebook goes up and down as people decide they like or they don't like what we're saying. Um, but it's very important for us to reach the people outside Facebook. Um, Corin, I don't know, you, you, you probably also know the stats about how many people, white people in South Africa, are living be below the poverty line. And it's estimated as anything between 850 and a million white people in South Africa. And that growing every day, Amor. Absolutely. Growing every day. Absolutely. And I mean, that will really, let's say, a million people who don't have a cell phone, who don't can't, they can't afford this. So those are also the people that, that we still, we are busy reaching. So I do believe that we need, you know, none of us thought we would be as far as we are today. Um, and some people maybe, you know, get a bit, why aren't you moving faster? Why aren't you moving faster? But I think we are slowly but surely winning the ground. And we are not a political party. We are an activist group. Mm. Mm. If it will be a political party, it will be Steve starting his own political party, which we then obviously will support. So after we started the, the Facebook group and we saw the huge growth and the huge um, interest in it, we registered then a not-for-profit company. Yes. Um, so we are now currently registered as a not-for-profit company in South Africa, which means that any donations, any money that we get goes ex immediately back into our cause. None of us gets a salary. So everybody who's involved in the management of Million Stemma for Steve are doing it voluntarily. We all have full-time jobs. Um, none of us in are itself, politicians. Very lucky. We we work from eight to five, and in between, after hours. Sorry, I said in itself, the fact that you have full time jobs is very yes. very lucky. Yes, yes. No, you're right. You're right. And if you so, um, if you're white and have a job in South Africa, you do everything you can to hang on to it. So you're not likely absolutely. to be doing this during working hours. Absolutely, absolutely. So yes, um, we 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 work in shifts, we um, support each other. We're a small group of about 11 people behind the scenes. Um, Steve is a director at the at the NPC, non-for-profit company. So he's involved with what we're doing, not on the day-to-day -day basis, but definitely on the strategic stuff that we do, the long-term planning. Mm. And we, we, do, we do hope to, to grow even further. I read a statistic the other day, um, that they say, whatever for a business, whatever you have supporters on Facebook, you could potentially multiply that by four to find out what you have in real life. Because there are so many people who are not always on Facebook or do not have the means to go onto social media. Yes. So, you know, in that instance, Steve also said the point has been made that it, it, we are not just a little small group of people who, you know, moan and groan about stuff. What's happening is we are showing everybody that we are we are a huge group. There are lots of people who feels fed up like we do. Absolutely. And so, Amor, could you tell us just a little bit about Steve? Because what has been done to him because of his activism is shocking. And, and the yes. world needs to realize that in South Africa, to stand up and say anything is very dangerous to your income, your welfare, your home, your family. Uh, people, because we have uh, freedom of speech in America, 
people would never under, know or even think about the things that have happened to Steve. Absolutely, Corin. Um, the thing is about South Africa, we have freedom of speech in our constitution, but it seems that it is only um, certain privileged people, if you are voting for the ANC, who allowed that freedom. So we have the freedom, but it's almost like a little bit animal farm. Farm. We all can speak, but some are allowed to speak a bit more than others. So what happened was when Steve Hofmeyer, so he is a really, really big artist in South Africa, like the platinum selling um, CDs. He, he's, he's really a famous South African artist who sings in Afrikaans. And he's also um, well known internationally because his show, yes, his tour in the yes. States last year was sold out long before he even got here. Absolutely. And he toured last year. He was in America. He was in England. He was in Australia. He was in Namibia. He was all around the world. And in Holland, Netherlands, Belgium, Belgium, those countries. And what happened was a few years ago, he started to say that, you know, making a little bit of noise about farm murders, about poverty, about job security of the white man in South Africa. And the moment that started to happen, quite a lot of radio stations that supported him playing his music, music started to slowly virtually boycott. Um, because they said he was politically incorrect and he was anti-establishment and they can just not associate with that. But it went further than that. Festivals that has been traditionally, you know, Steve has been the big name at this, the festival, started to boycott him because he decided that he is going to start singing our um, traditional anthem that we had before 1994 called in Afrikaans the stem or in Engels the voice. And what, what happened was in 1994, our anthem in South Africa has been changed. So we now have a new anthem, which is partly in a black language and partly our alt the voice anthem, a little bit of that in English. But the, the stem has, has become like a, a struggle song, if you could call it like that. But people, especially the ANC, don't like it when we sing it. So it's not been banned. It, 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 originally, it was a, a poem by one of our very famous um, poets in South Africa that has been put to music and that we all grew up with. So it's not a banned song or anything like that. In, in, nothing in the song says anything about killing anybody or hurting anybody. It's, it's a beautiful prayer about South Africa, the beautiful country that we live in and that we will live and die for this country. So he started to sing this song at concerts. Um, spontaneously. It was, it was not a decision that he made. He was just singing old traditional Afrikaans songs one day and he just started to play on his guitar and he sang it. And 5,000 people stood up and sang with him. And obviously for the government, that was a danger sign. They didn't like it. So festivals, organizers, promoters of festivals in South Africa, rock concerts in South Africa, they started to feel the pressure from different organizations that is not so pro Afrikaners and Afrikaans, and he's and they started to boycott him. So that meant that in a year he would attend, let's say, twelve rock concerts, and all of a sudden, eleven of them cancelled on him. They didn't want him anymore there. So that meant a huge loss of income, combined with radio stations that decided they will not play his music because it's not politically correct. Um, so that means that's a huge advertising opportunity for him that is gone. So there was a huge, I mean, he experienced quite a big part of his income being lost because of this. So he kind of became, and I think in a way that is why we are doing so good, because the more they alienated him, the more the, the, the Afrikaans white 
person, as well as the English white person, started to sit up and say, but why, why, are, why is he penalized for doing nothing wrong? And that is where we also then came in. And we started this group. And a lot of people say that, or are you a marketing arm for Steve Hoffmeyer? Not at all. We don't market him to sell his music. We don't need to. He's well known enough in any case. Even if all the concerts and all the shows boycott him, he just released his new CD and it went platinum within a month, two weeks, three weeks. Movie. Yes. So, so without any advertising, without him being played on radio stations, his CD still sold Better, I mean, there was a stage that he were number two on iTunes just below Adele. Um, so that is how big he is, and that is how many people he, he have that support his music. But that doesn't say that every person who likes Steve Hoffmeyer's music likes his political ideas. Yes. Um, but yes. still, for us, it means that there are a lot of people out there that tries to boycott him because of what he stands for. And it's exactly how the rest of us feel. We are also being boycotted, whether it is economically or socially or politically, because of what we believe in. And I think that is why Steve, in this instant, behind music, has so much support in South Africa, because even though he's this famous guy, in the end, he is exactly like me and you, and he has exactly the same problems because he's white than you and me in South Africa. Yes, he, and, um, he has been robbed. He has been burgled. He has more threats against him than anyone I can think of. And Absolutely. And he doesn't need to stand up for white people and more realistically. Yes, he is yes. famous. People know him. People love him. They love his music. He, ha he could quite happily just rake in the money from his music and live the good life. Instead of which, yes. instead of which he is bravely standing up at incredible financial loss to himself. Yes. So I would just quickly like to just play... Um, Steve singing the stem. It's very, very short, but I would like people to understand and to hear from Steve himself and to hear what a beautiful song it is. It's our old national anthem, which is basically a love song to our country. So just give me a second. <laughs> Now, although that was sung in Afrikaans, what I wanted the, the listeners to hear is the absolute um, joy with which the audience joined in and sang, because that song to us is our pride in our country. Absolutely, Karen. I mean, it, it, I've now in this year been to quite a lot of his shows. Um, and I must tell you, you, you get tears in your eyes. You get, you know, your heart is <laughs> going fast. When you stand in a crowd and when you start playing that intro on his guitar, everybody stands up like one man and everybody sings together. It is the most amazing feeling for me. And I think it's not because for us it's a revolution song. It's really like you say, it's our pride. When I grew up um, as a child, every single morning in school, we stood up um, and we, we sang our national anthem. 
and it was a really a proud thing for us. It taught us how to be proud uh, South Africans. Yes. And yes. now, even now, you know, to, to hear that song and to hear thousands of people singing together as one man, it is just the most amazing feeling for me. And it does not mean, more that we want to return to this terrible, evil apartheid system. It doesn't mean that at all. It simply means we love what our country was and we hate what our country has become. Absolutely, absolutely. You know what, Corin? I am not I'm not a person who wants to to go out and kill people and you know, because you're black, I hate you, you must suffer. I'm just not that kind of person. What I'm saying is, you know what? It's almost like being a battered woman. You are in a situation where you kind of realize too late that you are in big trouble. And you just want to get out there and you just want to be your, yourself again. It's exactly the same for us in South Africa as white people. We just want also to be safe in our own country, to be heard in our own country, um, not to be discriminated against, not to be killed, not to be tortured. That's all we're asking. We are here. Do not pretend we are not here. Do not kill us just because we are white. And for me, that is the biggest thing. I, I agree with you. I don't necessarily want to say apartheid was better or worse. No. But no. I was safer in apartheid. I had a voice in apartheid, which I don't have now. I have nothing. Um, what I have is, is almost, you know, every day you kind of hold up your... Let me tell you an ordinary day in my life. Yes. Please. I'm a single yes. white woman. Um, I, I wake up... I'm more, sorry. Uh, I wake up in the morning. Americans love such a relatively safe life, depending on where you live in America, of course. But they, they just have no idea how hard it is to live a day in South Africa with every second of fear that you live with. So you're a single white Do go up in the morning. The first thing is I understand God that I'm still alive. And people might think, you know, that is so strange. And some people might think, yes, I do it as well. I don't do it because I, I do it because I'm thankful for God, but I'm doing it because it is really a fear at night for me. Mm -hmm. So we live in we live in this prison, Scarlet. I mean, I don't think people who've never been to South Africa will really understand it, but we live in our houses are like Fort Knox. We have high walls, we have electric gates, we have alarms. All our windows are covered in um, steel bars. We have this fear that you know, even if you leave a window open, you're scared, somebody will come in at night and kill you. So you live in this this really, it, it's, as if it's like a jail that we live in. So you wake up in the morning, you go to work. On your way to work, for me, it is really, it's almost going out to war when I drive out of my gate because I don't know where will I be hijacked. You stop at a, at a robot or a stop street and your neck is like a, a, up and down and, you know, you always look at all the mirrors and you look uh, behind you because you don't know where somebody is going to come and run up to your car, break a window steal something or hijack you, put a gun against your head, um, abduct you. And so that is your first step in the morning. That's how you grow wake up. You don't, I'm just scared to work and I just pray that I get there safe. And it's really not exaggerating. It's really how it is, especially if you are alone in a car. Then you're at work and you... Worry the whole time about your house now, standing alone. There's nobody at home. Will you get home today and your house is burgled? Or will you get home and everything is still fine? Tonight when you get home, you are very thankful that everything... I mean, when I walk into my home every single day, I've realized it 
this week that I do it. I didn't even realize that I do it. I open my gate, I open and lock the door. And as I walk in, I mentally say, TV, radio, microwave, kettle. I walk down my passage, checking everything and mentally tick off that all my stuff is still in my house. How sad is that? Um, when you get at home, it's not, you, you know, at night, you know, South Africa this at, at the moment has got, have got a terrible heat wave. We, we, it's so hot. But alone at night, you're just scared to open your windows. Even though you've got burglar, um, burglar bars on your windows, yeah. I'm just scared because it takes nothing to break down burglar bars. You know, about a year ago, um, they tried to break in at my home. I forgot to close my dining room window. And the next morning when I got the, got to the front of my house, they, I saw the burgle bars were tampered with. And I, when I looked outside, they, they tried to, I don't know if they used a saw or whatever, um, and, but they tried to, to, to saw it off. And that's how it goes. You, you're too afraid to leave your windows open tonight when you go to bed because you don't know who will try to break in. Um, if you walk down my house in my passage, just before where the room starts, I've got another steel security door so that if they break in in the front part of the house, you know, at least if they have to come to the rooms, I will hear it. Um, so it's really, it, it's, it's difficult. At night, you sleep, but you, the moment you hear a noise, you're awake. You, you're always alert of the, the fact that somebody might be out to kill you. And Karen, that's no way to live. No, it isn't. Uh, and, and also the fact that you have been disarmed and the fact that if you were to attack, and never mind shoot, but to attack somebody who has broken into your home, you are the one who will be arrested. Absolutely, absolutely. Because you have killed somebody or you attacked somebody and for me, that's the saddest thing is that, you know, how do I protect myself? Yes, I've got pepper spray. spray. Yes, I've got, you know, all kind of things to, to protect myself. But in the end, whatever I use, I'm the one who's going to go to jail because I have infringed somebody else's human rights. Absolutely. The fact that they were in my house illegally and lawfully um, means nothing to the law. No, it doesn't. So, yes. And more as well, um, they never come in ones, ever, Absolutely. ever, ever. Absolutely. I have not seen recently anything less than four and mostly six to eight of them. Yes. You're a single woman. You're barricaded into your house. So getting out is going to be a nightmare once you find them there. <coughs> and you can't yes. defend yourself because you will be arrested. So these six or eight of them who've broken into your house are free to do whatever they want to you for as long as they want. Goran, that is for me, I think even the worst part of it is that let's say I, I hear somebody's in the house and I grab my phone and I phone our police. Um, just yesterday on the radio, there was again a big story about our, we've got like you guys got 911, we've got a, a 10 triple one police number. And there was a big story about people phoning into the specific radio station and saying that, you know, we had a burglary, we had an attack or whatever. We phoned um, 10 triple one and nobody answers the phone. Yes. We were on the line for 10, 15 minutes. Nobody answered the call. There's nobody at the call center. Yes. And if you're lucky enough that somebody does answer the phone, the police just don't come out. No. Um, the one lady said, you know, three hours after these intruders left my home, I phoned again to say, what's going on? Nobody's been here. And they said, yeah, we have problems um, with, with vehicles and stuff like that. But you know what? If she, if she died, if she was dead, what then? And that's a situation. You can't even phone your police to come and help you. Mm -hmm. So if there's four to six young black men attacking me, I have no chance. There's no chance that, that I will survive that because we see more and more. It's not just like it coming into your home, burglarized you. It is torture. They're torturing us 
Lord, and they not just even you know. I just pray that if if, if one of if I'm ever in that situation where I'm attacked in my home or wherever, they must just kill me immediately. But that is not even what's happening. They torture you for hours. They set people alight. They burn people with irons. They do the most horrific things, pour boiling water over people. So it's sadistic. It's not even just, you know, everybody says, but the poverty in South Africa is the problem, and that's why people break in your house and steal. It's not. No. They don't come to steal. They come to torture. Absolutely, because often they take nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely. After being in the house for three days, raping, torturing, burning, hurting, uh, they doing barbarous acts, and then they take nothing. Yes. Yes, now that is absolutely the truth. And I think, I, I, I honestly think, People from overseas sometimes think we are over telling the story, but I think we are under telling the story. We have not even really talked really as a one nation about what's going on. We've got lots of groups who's doing fantastic work trying to get the message out there. And I know, you know, I salute what you're doing, but there are so many people overseas that just don't even understand. They can't even form the picture in their head of what we live through every day. And then that is just our safety. There are, you know, I always say when I try to explain to people about genocide, is genocide is not just murder or rape. The genocide is so many things. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about our schools. You know, our language... Afrikaans is being annihilated. It, it's really, you know, laws are being formed to make sure that our children are not educated in their own mother tongue. Our religion in schools, are, there's no religion in schools anymore in South Africa. Um, children are not taught religions because there are so many religions and we have to be politically correct. So we cannot say there are just one or two. So that's how, how, how the Department of Education thinks. So let's rather not talk about religion at all. Pretend it doesn't exist. Um, pretend Afrikaans does not exist. Force the schools to teach everybody in English. Um, so that's, that for me is a first step of attacking our nation start with the children yes yes and and then it goes even further you know if you if you have a child in, in school in South Africa the only history that they are being taught is the history from the black perspective from 1960 so there's no history being taught from a white perspective there's no history from where how South Africa became a union, how it became a country. Nothing from Jan van Riebeek, who was the founder of South Africa. There's no, that history does not exist anymore. The history starts with Nelson Mandela. And that is the history. Our children are just being taught about black freedom fighters. There's no history. But a more, a more. All right, I'm digressing a little. But the history that the world knows and that the children are being taught about Nelson Mandela is not even the truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a pretty picture about St. Nelson. Yeah. It's not the truth. They are not taught that he was a terrorist. They are not even they are taught that about, he was a savior. Yes, they're not even taught why he went to jail. Because my biggest shock always is that people in the world think that Nelson Mandela went to jail because he was fighting for freedom. That is not true. He, he was not fighting for, for, for that. He was a terrorist who was a traitor and a, committing treason. And he, he, by rights, should have got the death sentence. In any country in the world, he would have got the death sentence for what he did. But they are taught that he was this miraculous man who who had his people and, and the the whole country because that's what he also said the whole country whites and blacks he had their welfare at heart and yet he was responsible for the deaths and the bodies <laughs> of thousands of people 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And you see, that is what really, really makes me angry is that um, why should my child be taught a lie? And why should my history, my true history, be denied for that child? So, yes, in our houses, we teach that to our children. But the thing is, in our schools, that is our first attack. Our children are being taught to be ashamed to be white. Because that is what's happening. Yes. Our children are taught that white people are bad, black people are good, because shame, look at poor Nelson Mandela. Look at what the white people did to him. Look at all these black struggle heroes. It was your mother, your father, your grandmother. They did it to this poor black man. Yeah. And I'm sorry, Warren. I am willing to admit a lot of things that were wrong. In apartheid, but I'm not. I'm not prepared to admit that we, as white people, should be sorry anymore. Should be ashamed of what happened in the past. Um, there's there's individual stuff that I will say. Yes, you know what? That was not right. But I am not going to let children of mine grow up being ashamed of being white and Afrikaans. And Afrikaans. And Afrikaans. Yes. Because I've read some articles this week. There was an article about what would South Africa be like without whites. And somebody counted yes. with what would South Africa be like about without blacks. Okay, so the, 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 the reality of that is that we are all settlers, or, or as, they call, as they call the whites, they call us settlers. We were all, yes. because we were there before them. We were there 120 to 150 years before the blacks came down from the north. So essentially, all of us colonized, blacks as well, colonized South Africa. But yes, would they have had the roads, the buildings, the technology, the hospitals, the universities without the white settlers? That is my question always. Had we Warren, you been there... Would they so right got today? They wouldn't. No, no, I don't think so. I mean, for me, the, the thing is how it is very easily for me to measure is South Africa has been under ANC rule for the past 21 years. And when they took over the country, they had a country that was working. We had electricity, we had water, we had a good school system, we had good education. Everything was in place. Infrastructure was in place, everything. But in 21 years, under the ANC rule, everything has gone to hell, if I can be so strong in saying that. No, absolutely. We, have, we have a national energy provider, ISCOM. Yes, I mean, we, we have load shedding, and I don't think people from other countries always understand the concept of load shedding. But what load shedding means is that we do not have enough electricity in our country to provide for everybody. In 1994, we had a, a lot of power. Um, which we were sending uh, to uh, outages, which was, which, you know, before 1994, if the power went off, it was because of weather, something like that. We had enough power stations that we actually exported electricity yes. to neighboring countries. Yes. Today in South Africa, because there were no maintenance done to the power stations, nothing. there was no a future plan. We, we're getting to be more people, so we have to build more power stations. So today what's happening in South Africa is we basically get certain hours in the day where certain towns' electricity is switched off for three, four, five hours because they're just not enough. Now I'm asking you if... If anybody tells me, you know, South Africa would have been better off if there were no whites here, I always use these examples and say, but you know what, for the past 21 years, you've been in charge of this. You got everything handed on a platter and you, there's nothing. What is happening? Why do we have load shedding? Why do we have a water crisis? You know, South Africa is heading at the moment for water shedding, the I same concept. I know that, that water will be switched off in towns for certain hours just to, to, to so that everybody in the country have a chance of a few hours of water. If if there were no whites in South Africa, this is what have been would have been like just ten times worse. 
because there wouldn't have been power supplies, power stations. There wouldn't have been dams. There wouldn't have been, been nothing like that. And the thing about what you say about the settlers, um, we all are settlers. You are so right. And this is one of the things that people don't understand. When Jan van Riebeek in 1652 came to South Africa, he came to a country where there was nothing. Like you Americas also were when your founding fathers yes. came to America. And as you had the Indian population in America, we had one population in South Africa, and that was the Khoisan. We didn't have blacks. It was the Khoisan. Well, they were yes, settled they in the Cape for years people. and years. Sorry? They're little yellow people. They're not when, what when outside of South Africa would consider African. They, they're not black. No. They're not tall. They're not big. They're little, small, yellow people. Yes, and they came from the south of Africa, southwest Africa, those parts. Mm. And when Jan van Riebeek established a, a settlement in Cape Town, he didn't steal their land, he bought land from them. Now, in 1652, they couldn't say, you know, yes, the papers, I own this land. But the white people were kind enough, were good enough to say, we are not just going to come into Africa and take, take, take. We will buy, we will refund you to use these pieces of land. Later on, years later, when um, the, the Bura, the Afrikaans Bura, then moved up in Africa, they have then only started to make contact with black people. And the black people they made contact with in those days were not people who lived in one place for generations. They were traveling, they had cows, they had sheep, and they were really traveling from this spot to that spot. So they were traveling all over the country. They came up from North Africa, Northern Africa, and they were they came to, to the lower part of Africa to find more grass and stuff for their animals to eat. So they didn't own the land either. No. It wasn't there also either. What I say is that on their way south, they killed and annihilated hundreds of tribes of blacks along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is what really gets me today. If, if Julius Malema stands up and says, we must take back our land. What land? You didn't owe it. You know, the Bura, the South African, the Voortrekkers, when they went up in North, in South Africa, from Cape Town up to where Pretoria and Tanin is today, wherever they went, they didn't just say, this is my piece of land. They refunded whoever was on that land. They, they refunded people for that piece of land. So we bought land from the beginning from people who didn't even own it. It wasn't really theirs to sell. Absolutely. But we still bought land from them. And now the ANC and the EFF in South Africa wants to say, we stole their land. Oh, my goodness. You know what? I get so angry. We didn't steal anything. It wasn't even yours to sell. But exactly. we bought it from you. Exactly. So how could we have stolen it? Exactly, Amor. And now... Um, to, to um, expand on that, what are they doing to those poor farmers in South Africa? They're doing a Zimbabwe on them, aren't they? I mean, yes. they did say uh, originally that land redistribution would be a willing seller and a willing buyer price and at a decent market-related price. But I know of farmers who've been waiting 15 years to get the money for the farm that that was taken from them. And now, now they have gone two different routes because that land redistribution is not going fast enough. One is yeah. each farmer must give over 50% of his land to his employers, employees. And the other one is that we'll just nationalize all the land and take it away from you. Absolutely, absolutely, Goran. So again, it is the incompetence that mm. has brought us to this to this stage now where, and you know what, I think we must 
actually include a third option we, we, that you just said. Yes, let's give one of the options is give 50% to your black farmers. The second one is we nationalize. But you know what? In the meantime, while we're make, making, waiting to make up our mind, let's kill the farmers. Yes. Because if we yes. kill the farmer, that farm will not be operational. It will be so much. We'll get it dirty. You know, people will just want to buy it to get away from that horrible experience. So let's do that. We kill the farmers. We, we, you know, then we have got a good reason to say we as black people must take over the farm. Absolutely. And I honestly think that's what's happening. And then no more, what happens to that farm? A fully productive, huge farm. What does it become? It becomes a rundown piece of land where animals have to be taken by the SPCA because they don't have food. There was, I mean, there's so many cases of that in this past year where, where black farmers who were given a farm by the government, they were, you know, they the government even buy animals for them. They buy seeds for them. They just have to farm. Yes. And nothing happens there. So the animals die of hunger and the SPCA has to be called in to just rescue these poor cows and chickens and sheep and whatever, pigs. You know, you have in South Africa, you see very, very thin pigs because even the pigs are not being fed on a farm where blacks are in charge. And the problem is we are losing a lot of food in the process. Yes. Black farmers are given implements. They are giving seeds. They are given everything they need. But still, there is no output no no production so, whatsoever so millions of government money my tax money goes into this these farmers to help them to support them but there's no output there's no food supply from them and our commercial farmers who are actually providing food are being killed so where will that leave us um yes so yes i mean the population is exploding. It really is. I mean, with, with the influx from Zimbabwe and other places, the population in, in, in South Africa has exploded. And, and nobody really knows how many people live there. And, and, and the food resources are declining. And then add to that this incredible period of drought that South Africa has been in and the government refusal to give aid to white farmers. They will help the black farmers, and they say that quite openly. But white farmers must find a different way of farming in order to survive this. That was the exactly. statement. How ridiculous is that? How ridiculous is that to say, you white farmers are providing 90% of the food supply, but now there's a drought, and sorry for you, you just want to make your own plan to get any kind of relief, whether it's food for your animals or water for your crops, it's not really our problem. Yes. We will help the black farmers that produce nothing, but we will help them. How ridiculous is that? I, I, I can't understand it. And you know, you know, Amor, this is not really funny, but it's one, one of my favorite quotes from, from the Minister of Water Resources. It, it, it's not funny, but in an international sense, it's hilarious. I mean, the woman stood up and said, well, the, the water crisis is now the fault of apartheid because apartheid built the dams too big, so they take too long to fill. If they had built smaller dams, we would not have a water problem. And this is the Minister of Water Affairs. Absolutely. It, it's Absolutely. Ridiculous. And it's beyond ridiculous. No, it is. But, I mean, Corin, that is another thing that, that you must understand, and I know you understand it, but your listeners must understand, is that no matter what goes wrong in South Africa, it's always apartheid's fault. And no matter what goes right, not that a lot goes right, <laughs> it will always be the ANCs, you know. Well, look at how wonderful they were. Yes, yes. And I'm really fed up with that. You know what? I'm really fed up. I believe what makes me really angry is um, now in the past month or so, we had a lot of riots at our universities. So now we're talking about kids 18, 19, 20 years old who are demonstrating burning down the universities, burning tires, killing co-students out of rage and because they want to study for free and they want everything to be in English. My question is this. 
they are 18, 19 years old. They grew up in the new South Africa, mm -hmm. which is 21 years old. Yes. How can they still say everything that's wrong in my life is apartheid's fault? They were not even born in apartheid. They were born under the ANC regime. They even call themselves born freeze. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, that's how ridiculous it's becoming in South Africa. Um, apartheid, you know, if the wind is just blowing too much, it's probably also apartheid's fault because we didn't buy... I don't know. But, you know, it's just so ridiculous for me that everything is blamed on apartheid. And I cannot understand why a black South African who lives also in poverty can still turn around and say, but you know what? The ANC is good to us. Yeah. I don't understand this loyalty, this blind loyalty to the ANC and the EFF who has only made their lives worse. Who has absolutely destroyed the country. I mean, black, young, uh, unemployment youth between, yeah. between 18 and 24, so unemployment, is over 60%. Yes, and yes. they still vote ANC. Yes, yes. I, it's it's a blind, blind loyalty that I just don't understand. I, I, I honestly tell you, I don't know how anybody can be as stupid as voting for a party who has done nothing but, and in the contrary, even made things worse. But they still support them. I don't understand that. Absolutely. But that is our leaders of tomorrow. Yep. Yeah, these ones who are now we have they reduced the past a mark to thirty percent, and now they're talking about reducing it to ten percent, ten percent. So, what kind of student is going to come out of university? And you'll probably be given that exactly. ten percent simply for attending the the exam. You know, yes. At the end yes. of the day, that's what they'll do. So, what kind of people are we? are going to be, I don't say that our present leaders are educated because they certainly are not. No, definitely not. But, but, but I mean, yes, I mean, it's just getting worse and worse. Yes. It's unbelievable to me that, that this would be how our country is run. And, and now the, the, the riots at the university stopping people from writing their exams and burning them down, millions and millions of rands worth of damages. But more, why? If you willingly go and enroll at an Afrikaans university, you know when you enrolled that it's Afrikaans. And then you burn the place down because they're teaching you in Afrikaans. It doesn't make any sense. Welcome back to Radio Free South Africa with your host, Karen Smith. Our guest today is Amor Gerber from Million Stemmer for Steve. Before we continue with the show, after every show, I get emails from people that tell me that they would love to help the destitute, dispossessed white South Africans, but that they either do not know how or lack the means to do anything significant. Well, this is how anyone can contribute to saving white lives and bringing them to freedom. The cost of getting one white South African out of that hellhole and bringing them to the USA is around $3,000. Not a lot of money to save a life, but definitely not an amount that most of us can give at one time. However, every one of us can give 10 or $20 to this literally life or death cause. So please, think of the satisfaction of knowing that you helped to save a life and donate the best amount you can afford to our PayPal account, cooks595 at yahoo.com. That's Charlie, Oscar, Oscar, Kilo, Sugar, 595 at yahoo.com. You will be glad that you did. And we're back with a more. Amor, you were talking yes, originally about a part, um, about genocide, how the genocide is not thousands of bodies piling up, not necessarily thousands of bodies piling up in the streets, although we have that too, because the number of whites killed is estimated at 85,000, um, but we don't know and we will never know how many it really is. So you spoke about the education 
And we need to talk about the other steps that are, that are being used against the white to prove that there is a genocide happening, um, but slowly. So there's the education and the destruction of your language and your history. And more than that, they're taking down your statues to the Afrikaner heroes who built the country. Can you tell us something about that? Yes, I mean, it is a, it's a, really for me, I believe it's a total on, onslaught, Karen, um, on every aspect of South, uh, white South African we are attacked. Um, there is, at this stage, we have in all of our little towns and in the big cities, traditionally, you know, the towns were established by some voortrekker, some settler from the Cape who came up and usually in a town something happened, there might have been this guy who's, who started the town or, you know, there might have been maybe a, a war or something and they are then um, honoured, they were honoured in this town with their own um, statue. Yeah. So what's happening now currently is not only is town's names changed to some strange African name that nobody knows what it means, that the street names are changed. So, you know, a, a street name that might have been Van Ribiekstraat was is now Oliver Tambo Street or something like that. But the next step is now also removing our statutes. So the first step is they start at night, um, throwing paint over our statues. So, you know, it's vandalism. Yes. They try to break them down. So pieces of a statue will be broken down or will be cut off and stuff like that. So, yes, that is absolutely happening. It's part of removing our history from this country. It's part of not only do they want to remove us as white people from South Africa, but they also want to make sure that nothing of our history remains. Yes. So on, on that instance, yes, it's not just statues, it's also town names, it's street names, everything that has anything to do with the, the Afrikaans, South African history is being vandalized, is being taken away, is being destroyed. So in the end, nothing will be left. Um, I think the plan is honestly that the, the the end target of this whole exercise is that in a few years' time, there won't be whites left, there won't be any of our history left. It would be as if South Africa started the day Nelson Mandela was released from prison. And I think that's what, what they are working. That's, that's a feeling I get, what they are working towards. Even our poets' statues are being vandalized and taken down. So nothing is safe anymore as much as we are forced and it's it's pushed down our children's throat to acknowledge and to honor the black history of south africa exactly the same effort is being um, used to to destroy the white history that there will be nothing left one day and then of course there's the the economic effect of uh, on whites as well because whites have been totally, or, or almost totally, I mean, there are whites who have a job, you have a job. But the, the point is, if you lost your job, you wouldn't get another one, would you? Not easily, not easily. And um, the thing is, Karen, even in my current job, um, there, there's no way that I will get a promotion. I am stuck where I am for the rest of my life. So in, unless I do something else and, and do something for myself, which is also problematic in South Africa, oh. um, you know, at least I've got a little bit of an advantage. I'm a woman. So in the, 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 the black economic empowerment, being a woman counts a little bit. Um, being a white woman, mm, that's a bit of a negative issue. But yes, I mean, economically, you know, again, because... In South Africa, in the past 21 years, we are not able to keep stats because we've got people in power that I think either have decided from the beginning to hide the true stats or are just yes. incompetent to count. Yes. But there are no official stats of how many white people live in 
mm. live under the, the poverty line or in, in what we call squatter camps. Um, there is no official stats. Well, the last stat that we got sorry, was about... Mm. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I read yes. it, uh, an, a government official statement in South Africa that said the poor whites are so few that we were unable to quantify it. That was a statement put out by the government, which is totally Absolutely. untrue. Yes, I mean, Karen, you know, um, in, in, in Stats SA, which is our official governmental statistics department, they say that um, there are less than 30,000 white people who are poor. They don't say that they are living under the bread line. They say they are poor. Now, poor means for me, uh, they can't afford everything, but they survive and they're okay. Yes. But the truth is, there are between 850 and a million that we think people in South Africa that do not have food tonight to eat, white people who do not have a house, who do, who living under bridges, who, who have nothing. And the sad thing about that is those were people who all had a job, who all had an income, but lost it in the past 21 years because of the laws against whites. Now, we are only about four and a half million white people in South Africa. A million of them, we suspect, it could be much more, are living like animals out in the open, scavenging for food, having nothing. How can the government say it is too little to even report? That makes me angry. Yes, because it's it's between 20 and 25 percent of whites in South Africa. And as you so rightly said, Amor, these are not people who uh, went, took to the streets begging because they're too lazy to work. These are engineers and, and, and qualified, highly qualified people who've no doubt been replaced in their job by three or more unqualified black people. And they will never be employed again. Now, for me, the worst part of that is the children, because if the parents do not have a home and don't know where the next meal is coming from, they cannot afford to send their children to school. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those children are not educated. They, they have no means of getting an education. You know, Corin, um, at Million Simba for Steve, we we work a lot with um, people in these communities. We have what we call a purple bag project where we ask people to donate 300 South African rands, mm. um, which is about, I think it's less than $30 if I think about what the rand is doing at the moment. Oh, my goodness, um, it's, probably, it's probably more like about $20 maybe, maybe. I don't yes. know. <laughs> Who knows today what the rand is at, you know? Yeah. Now, but what we do is we, we, we work with a lot of organizations that tell us there and then there's a need. So we get this money and we buy food for four people, enough for two weeks, and we take it to them. But for me, I think that it's really hurting me on a level that I didn't know exist within me, is when you give people a bag full of food, which, you know, it's not luxury food. It is... It is really not luxury food, but we we the the, the ex, expression on their faces. These are people who has been cast away. Nobody cares about them in this country, except you know a few organisations that really works hard to help them. Um, but these are people who who have just cast been casted away. They they nothing in nobody's eyes. They have to live like. Really, you know, I, I cannot explain to, to people who haven't seen it how these people live. They have nothing. They wear the same pair of shoes and pants and shirt day after day after day. Children have, have clothes on that is miles to, sh to, to um, small. small for them. Um, these people are not 
they, they don't have food. They take you into their house and then it's a family of four living in a two by three little small room, two meters by three meters room. It is so small, so crowded. And they have absolutely nothing. And the look in their eyes, it is one of desolation, of hopelessness. Total, I, yeah, it is, it's just that sadness of knowing that we are lost and nobody cares and nobody will help. And, and then when you pitch up there with old clothes, old shoes, you know, um, food, it is this, it's like Christmas for them. There's somebody coming who actually thinks we are worth it to help us. How sad is it to live like that in your own country? You're not a refugee. You are not a political um, prisoner. You are a free person in your own country. But you cannot even afford to buy a bread to feed your children. And that is what's going on in South Africa. And then there are the two, the two things against these people. There's the ANC government, which does not give aid to any any whites whatsoever, and because of the laws, the big organizations also cannot give aid to whites because they will be penalized for it. And on Absolutely. the other hand of that, Amor, which is something we do not talk about, is the well-off white South Africans who live a life totally insulated from this poverty and devastation, and many of them even refuse to admit that it exists. So they Absolutely. say that everything's great in the Rainbow Nation because they are still employed. They still live in their big houses, in their gated communities. They are safe and insulated from the reality of what South Africa is. So these poor people, this million <coughs> whites, are caught between these two rocks and there's no hope for them. Absolutely, Karen. And you know, um, talking about these white people in South Africa that, turn, that turns their back on this, um, I think that for me is, is the biggest fight I'm fighting every day of my life. Because you are right, there are even middle class white people who are just refusing to admit that something is wrong. They are living in this, I don't know if they are are just, you know, trying, pretending that nothing is wrong. But they live their lives as if no, there's nothing wrong. There's no other people that's suffering. And if they give anything, it's for the shame, the poor black people who's yes. poor. Yes. And, and that really, really, really gets me because, like you said, the government has so many projects and um, departments that gives aid to the black South African who needs money. And yes, there are many of them as well. There are millions of them. But why should I also give? My tax money is already going for, mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. Why should I also now give to them? And that is why it's important for us to look after our own people. Because if we as organizations who are working with these people are not standing together and helping each other, um, nobody else will help them. You know... Nobody cares about them. No, they they are just out there, and I think for and I think really sometimes um, a lot of the black the, the black government think they hope they will just disappear. So we're not going to leave help them at all. Let them just die of poverty. And for me, the the bad thing is that there are white people that also think that because they do not want to admit what is going on. They call us far right. They call us, yes. you know, what racist. they call us horrible. Now. Racist. But I don't care. Yeah, we are racist. We are, we are playing on people's emotions to uh -huh. say there's a genocide. There's no genocide going on in South Africa. The truth is there is. The truth is we are attacked from all angles. And we are slowly but surely bleeding to death as a white nation. You know what, I just want to quickly go back to the, the, the farmers. Yeah. In 1994, we had 120,000 white commercial farmers in South Africa. 
In 2015, we have 40,000 white commercial farmers in South Africa. We have lost 80,000 farmers who produced food. Some of them were killed, a lot of them were killed. Some of them just gave up. They, they couldn't because they, they, they were too scared. They, you know, you fear for your life. There's no aid from government. And that is the country that we live in. And then white people still say, but no, there's no genocide. There's nothing wrong. It's just a, a small fringe group of white um, South Africans who are racist. And we don't want to be associated with them. Um, here's our money. We will give it to the, to the black parties. And we yes. will give it to the black squatter camps. Because they don't want to see this. And I really, really, it saddens me because... This is where we need to help each other. Yes. Um, and, 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 you know, even in my organization, it is so hard. People agree what we're saying. They support what we're saying until you ask them to don donate. Then they are, yeah, but you know what? We're also suffering and it's also hard for us. I understand that. But I like what you said in your ad now. You don't have to give the full amount. Give the $10 or the $20. Yes. You yes. know what? Even That's all we ask of people to, to support us. To For you, for me, for whoever is fighting and trying to help the white people in South Africa. We don't say you have to have millions to give us. Mm -hmm. Because your small contribution helps. But it's even a battle to get that out of some of the white people in South Africa because they do not want to admit that there's a problem. And more, I work very closely with South African Family Relief Project. Yes. Now, they have done the most that I know of any group. They have done the most. They are active throughout South Africa. They have done amazing work. And they're all also volunteers who don't get paid. Yes. Today. They yes, don't get yes. paid. Now, I work very closely with them. And if anybody who is listening would like to donate to that cause and see what they do, their webpage is S for Sugar, A, F for Freddy, R, P for Peter, S for Sugar, A, dot org. S A F R P sa.org now they post on that page every single day pictures of the camps they've been to work that they've done their donations that they've taken there now they are grateful for any help whatsoever there's a donate button on their page and please 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 especially at this time of year and especially with the water shortage in south africa these people don't have water they normally don't have very much water, but right now they have none. And they are living in the most horrific, inhumane conditions where they are literally boiling to death. So think of the elderly, the ill, and the children. And please, please, please help these people. You have no idea how much $5 can do for a family there. You can feed a family of four on approximately $15 a week at today's exchange rate. So, you, you know, there are many charities in South Africa and a lot of them are just putting money in their own pockets on the back of these poor people, which makes me so angry I could spit. But I know that this organization in particular, every cent goes to help the people in need. And there are, as we said, a million or more of them that are living worse than we would treat wild and uh, our cows, our donkeys, we treat them better than these people are treated. Sorry, I'm all just a little... Absolutely. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm actually glad you said that because we do work with them also. And I can, I can just add to what you're saying and confirm what you're saying is please help them because they do such great work. And I know that, you know, I, if, if somebody contacts me and say, I've got a family living under a bridge, can you help me? We don't have the network that, I, that they have. I contact Lee, who is in charge of the organization, and I say, Lee, help. And it is like immediate, she sends out people and it starts, the wheel starts turning. So please, if I can from my side also say, help them because they are doing such a wonderful work 
in South Africa. And you know what, Colin, we had also had a few of the charlatan organizations that pretend that they do good and they ask money and they ask clothes and they ask food and they really take it for themselves or you know even in certain camps you you will see there's a a person who's in charge of the camp you take food there and that person takes it for themselves and they don't give it to everybody yes. so i knew no person from personal experience with them that they make sure that the food gets to the right people they make sure that everybody gets something so so yes i mean and i think that is what we are all about at Million Simmer for Steve is that to say that there are such wonderful organizations doing so good and we have to take hands and help Absolutely. each other. Um, and, and that's the only way we're going to get through this is that we take hands and we say there are so many splinter groups. We, we forget about who likes this one and who doesn't like that one. Yes. We take hands and we all work together because we are such a small group of white people in South Africa. We cannot afford to not work together. And, oh. and so I agree with, please, if people want to um, donate money to them, help them because they are really helping everywhere in the country. Uh, they do amazing work. I, I, you said uh, you don't know how you manage uh, with the look in these people's eyes, the sadness and the desperation in their yeah. eyes. Now, this small group of people do this every single day of their lives. Yeah. Day, yeah. Every day. They deal with the sick babies. They deal with the pregnant mothers. They deal with drug abuse. And they are not huge heroic people with tons of money behind them because what Lee told me was that they get no financial donations from South Africa. They get clothes and food, but South Africans yeah. do not donate money to them. So the money that they get comes from outside of South Africa. And with that, they have created miracles. They put floors in at Mansiville yeah. so that they, people have a floor instead of a rubbish heap uh, in their houses. They have provided wa taps of water. They've provided porta potties. They have uh, helped children in hospital get them to the dentist. They do miracles, those people. I cannot Absolutely. thank them enough because I personally I don't think I'm strong enough to do that anymore. I couldn't face that. I must I must tell you, I don't know. I, I really take my hat off to Lee and her team because for me, you know, we help wherever we can, but it's not a daily thing. So maybe over weekends we will go and help people where they specifically request help and where we can help them. And it is emotionally draining. It is so sad. So I agree with you. I take my hat off for Lee and her organization because what she does is, is is absolutely fantastic and I don't know if I will be able to to take that on a daily basis to see on a daily basis what is being done to our people so yes I agree with you 100% yeah more I couldn't do it I just could not do it I I know that I I, I couldn't. I would collapse in a weeping heap. I would not be able to do it. I, I just, they're, they're incredible. But, but what frightens me is that there is a need for that on such a big scale that we need those people. We shouldn't have yeah. to. You should have Exactly. To. Exactly. That's my point as well, Corin. You may live in a country that says there's equal opportunities, equal rights. We 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 have one of the best um, constitutions in the world, but it's on paper. Yes. Um, and, and that's why we need these organizations. We need people to help us to donate money from overseas. I mean, that's why I'm talking to you, to your American and worldwide listeners, is because we want people from outside to please hear our voice and start helping us because we cannot do this on our own. But the problem we live in a country where, where we, we're supposed to be free and living without fear, but we're not. Mm -mm. The, pro the biggest problem, Amor, that, that, that South Africans face is the lack of knowledge because I know every American, Canadian, New Zealand, Australian person that I deal with one-on-one -on -one is horrified and absolutely willing to help. 
The problem is they can't help if they don't know. And the press and the media and the TV and the, nobody is talking about it. So the world is ignorant about your plight. <laughs> Yes, and I think that is another part of what I see as genocide is the silence in the media about what's happening in our country. I mean, South African media um, are so political correct that they do not report profile murders. They do not report on anything like poverty of white people. They ignore it. It just doesn't exist. And and that's for me as part of the whole thing is that what's happening is being kept a secret mm. um, to the rest of the world. We tell them how poor our black, you know, the black children are too poor. They can't go to university and please help them. But we don't tell them the whole story. And that for me is also part of why there are white people in South Africa that thinks, no, everything is fine. Because if we don't read it in the newspaper, it can't be true. Yes. But it's because yes. the newspaper and the news agencies do not report it. They keep it silent. They, they, they lie about statistics. They don't tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. And that is for me. It makes me so angry. Because... It, it, uh, more, am, am I correct? Because I've seen this so often. When they talk about crime in the media, which is not so much, you will always see white hands handcuffed, although whites were not the criminals. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a standard stock photo that they use for any crime story. It's the, the white man's hand, hands that is, is, is in the... Um, handcuffed back. Handcuffed. Back. Yeah. handcuffed and... And, and let me tell you, Corin, another thing that is very interesting and very sad is should something happen, let's say a white man has committed a crime, that story will be in on the front pages for days about a white man, whether he has stolen money or killed his family or whatever. Yes. yes. But that is one, one isolated thing that happened and it will be reported on all the radio the tv the newspapers for days they will make this huge story about yes. this one yes white person did something wrong but nothing is being said about the black people killing the white people and you know when you raise it when you phone a radio station in south africa and the main media and you say but what about the farm murders um the, the reporters they will straight they will tell you straight off, you know what farm murders is not a priority. There are millions of people being killed in South Africa and farm murders is not important because that is just a little small thing that happens. But let me tell you, in South Africa, since January, sixty two farmers have been killed. Yes. In November November alone we had thirty one farm attacks in 30 days. Yes. Today yes. we are on 12th of December. In for December, we already have five murders, four murders that has been committed. And we had 18 attacks. We are 12 days into this month and 18 farms have been attacked already. Now, why can we have these statistics independently among ourselves? Yes. But the mainstream media don't have it. They say they don't know about it or, no, this is not important. How can it not be important to, to have 31 farm attacks in 30 days' time or 18 attacks in 12 days' time? How can that not be important? Absolutely. I'm and that's and, and, the other thing I, I really, that this is very, very close to my heart. It is one of my, my absolute passions is that we talk about the people who are dead. Now, it's desperately bad. It is horrible. I'm not negating or, or trivializing the deaths. It is awful. It is terrible. But the survivors are more. If you have survived rape, with broomsticks, with broken bottles, if you have been burnt with an iron, your face pressed onto a hot stove, your children killed in front of you, and you live. First of all, you probably have AIDS. Probably. In fact, more than likely. But how do you live 
the rest of your days with those memories. And there is no help for you. There is no, uh, um, let's send this person to see a psychologist or let's give them therapy or whatever. There's nobody that cares. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, you know, they have to live with that trauma for the rest of their lives. Um, and they do not necessarily have the means and the funds to go to a private psychologist or counsellor to help them deal with these issues. Um, so I agree with you that, you know, they are just left and they are forgotten yes. by the rest of the country. You know, yes. we all all read about it and then people will say, oh, shame that you hear about that farmer being killed, his poor family. But that's it. Yeah. And then, you know, poor family, what then? Yes. So that is one of our biggest projects at Bullion Stemmer for Steve. We call it Love Your Farmer, He Feeds You. Um, it's, it's also to help the survivors of these attacks. And we do fundraising specifically for that. You know, when a farm murder happens um, and somebody is killed and the rest of the family survive it, what means are there for them? Now they are in the situation, the police are on the farm eventually, they have to go somewhere. So what we are doing, we are we have the project that we want to assist and say, okay, let's help you. We, we will get, book you into a hotel or a guest house or give you the means to get to, to family where you can be safe. Because they don't want to go back to that farm. No. Um, no. We will help you with counseling. We will provide you people to help you through this trauma. There are so many things that must happen after this attack, you know, and, and there's nobody helping. So that is one of our passions, that that the farm, the survivors of this farm murder, that they must be helped because they are the ones who's forgotten. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, most of the times after the farmer has been killed, because most of the time the target is the man, the farmer. Yes, yes. You know, the wife, the kids, they don't have an income anymore. They have nowhere to go. They can't, they don't want to go back to the farm. So they might sell the farm and they might get a few rand for it. And, <clears throat> but where do they go from there to start a new life? And we feel that it's very important that we provide some kind of support structure and we are it's something that we want to go big on in 2016 um, that we really provide for the survivors a whole package deal of how we can help you in terms of going forward because you're right they've forgotten <coughs> nobody cares they must not go on on their own and and that's it nobody cares because Amor in South Africa because there are so many of these happening every single day. People, as you say, are desensitized. They say, oh, sorry, did you hear about it? Oh, gee, that's sad. And move on. Because yeah, yeah. it has become the new normal is that every day you're going to be inundated with murders, with rapes, with hijackings, with kidnapped children, with people disappeared. And your brain cannot take it in. You reach a stage where you just can't anymore. So you, you do, you read about it and move on because, well, I, I can't deal with it. So these yeah. people do not get any help. They're the forgotten, uncared about people because we are so desensitized to the tragedy. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, every time a, a farmer gets killed, it's not just the farmer, it's the whole community. And people forget that. It's not just the wife and the children. They are obviously very, very close to this and they are for us the priority. But it's also the farm workers on that farm. They get displaced. Yes. So, so they also lose their farm. They also lose their job. They also lose their, their income. But nobody cares about that. No. Where is their government now to care? They don't care because they are just so glad there's another wife that's dead. There's another farm that we can get for, for almost nothing. So we don't really care about anything else. And so it's a whole food. system that is affected. Yes. Yes, Amor, until there's no food. Until there's no food. Absolutely. And then what? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
I mean, my biggest fear is now with the drought. You know, I'm currently in Durban and I stay in Pretoria. But Friday, I drove down to Durban and you drive through the Free State. And the Free State is the biggest province in our country that provides provide maize. Yes. And this time of the year, the, the millies or the, you know, the, the, the maize are sky high. You know, if you stand, if a man stand next to it, it goes over your head so big it is. Yes. And you know what? I saw in the whole 600 odd kilometers that I drove on Friday, I saw one farm who had maize planted. All the other farms are bare because they this it is just too dry they couldn't plant they couldn't sow the seed so that means that we're going to have a huge 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 um food crisis next year because the farmers couldn't plant this year a, a huge group of farmers in south africa just couldn't plow and plant their seeds there's and, nothing on the field and what what and that is scary what, and, and that is because the government said we're not going to help those farmers. Yes. And maize, millies, are the staple food of the majority of South Africans. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, so what's going to happen next year? Next year, we are going to have a huge crisis with food. But that is why I, I, I honestly don't understand if, if the government is incompetent or stupid or just plain um thieves <laughs> thieves yeah they, they, well they are thieves but they can't see this they can't see the long-term effect there's a draw, drought so the first response is yes but we're only going to help black farmers they don't understand that the commercial farmers are the ones who put the food on the shelves in the store yes. if you don't have them there's not going to be food so we are just spiteful now we are spiteful we say we're not going to help the white farmers but we are spiting ourselves but they don't understand that and no. that's what gets to me because how can they run a country and they don't even understand the concept of food supply well uh, Amor, what worries me is that you're going to have to import food tons of it very soon yes. but yes. South African rand is worth nothing even Zimbabwe is refusing to take rands so yes. with this latest uh, President Zuma circus of firing the finance minister uh, um, and the world now getting well the whole world has gone insane I mean your your share price has dropped the rand has gone uh, it's fallen lower than it has ever been in history after he fought yeah. that guy. So now yeah. you are going to have to import hundreds of tons of food. How are you going yeah. to pay for it? With what? But exactly, what exactly, for? exactly. But that is what, what I'm telling you. It, it, it gets to me that, that our country is run by people who don't understand this. You know, since this minister has been fired um, this week, the RAND has fall 8%. Um, and like you said, it is it is so low. It, it we I mean the rating agencies are on the brink to call the South African rand, rand junk. Yes, we we're gonna get that junk status very soon, and that means we can't get any foreign investment. We can't get loans from overseas. Yes. We can do nothing. Yes. So how are we? You're right. How are we going to pay to get food from other countries? Because nobody will want to do business with us. Nobody is going to sell that food on credit to us. No. So so what then? And and that is what I don't understand. If ordinary people like you and me can understand the crisis, why can't a government that is supposed to look after their people don't? Why can't they understand that? I mean, just in 2015, the rand has fallen. 30%. Yes. It is it's ridiculous. You're right. It's a circus. It's crazy mm. what's happening in our country. And and no, the, the international companies, they are not going to last in South Africa. They're going to take their stuff and leave because why would they be here with all the, in any case, all the strict rules around um, empowerment and, and, and black empowerment and now the rand, that means nothing. Why would they even want to be here? Well, Amor, so all of these things is adding up, what and we're getting, getting to a me, big process. What is getting to me is that 
this week, or it may have been late last week, the Zimbabwean government has just unilaterally declared that every company who works in Zimbabwe now has to give 51% of the shares of that company to their black employees. Give it, not sell it, give it. Now, no, no. Julius Malema is saying the same thing. And in the last uh, Khotla, the meeting that the ANC had, they also put forward that same plan. Now, if they yes. sign that into law, what international company has the means or the power to give 51% of its shares away. They cannot. They've got shareholders that they are responsible to. Their, their, their whole thing is about bottom line and profit. What company has the power to do that? And so if they pass that as a law, that company will leave. They have to. Absolutely, absolutely. But can you see how ridiculous the law is? And it's totally, totally, totally based on the fact that, and that's also for me part of the genocide, that they want, they do not want white South Africans to have economic freedom. So what, and, and it's in the act that is, we're waiting for it to be signed, the new broad-based economic empowerment act, that they said that, um, and it's in there, it's written in there, 51% of your business have to go to a black shareholder. Now you've got a family business who has been producing whatever, making money, supplying jobs for the past 10 years, 20 years, generations. Um, now all of a sudden, a building, the, uh, the building, a business that you have built up over these years, you have to give the majority away to a black partner who has done nothing who probably can't even run the business. Yes. But you have to give ownership of your business to a black person. How ridiculous is that? Where have you heard in your life that something like that is acceptable anywhere in the world? And yet, in South Africa and Africa, it is the norm. Why aren't the rest of the world not shouting about this? And yes, you're right, because they don't know. And and that's why I, I, I can just say thank you, thank you, thank you, that you are always so willing to speak to us and the, for all this, the work that you do to tell the world what's going on. Because it is totally ridiculous. Here you have a farmer. I mean, a farm is a business. It's registered as a company. Yes. Now you have to give 51% of your farm away to somebody, you don't know this person, you have no, no history with this person, you have to give it away, you're not even selling it, you are saying, here you go, you are now the owner of this farm, and I, who built this up for generations, I will now be working for you. I mean, it, it's just for me, if it wasn't so shocking, it would have been laughable. Yes, absolutely. It is like, it's like a, a fairy tale that you hear about and think, yeah, well, but it's reality for us. For yes. us in South Africa, yes. this is our reality. Amor, we are very close to the end of the show. So, if, um, and, you know, it ends very abruptly. So if you would like to just tell people what website they can go to to see what you're doing and just quickly tell us about your new radio station, on which congratulations, by the way. Thank you very much, Karen. Yes, um, if anybody wants to see what we are doing, they can either join our Facebook group, which is called Muljun Stemme for Steve. Um, I don't know if you can maybe place it somewhere for people to see, Karen. Um, we also have a campaign running on Indiegogo. Um, also Muljun Stemme for Steve, if you want to donate anything towards us, um, you can donate it through there. Um, yes, we have started our radio station on the 1st of December. We are very excited from this side. And for us, it is just another way of spreading the word in South Africa of what's going on. Um, we are on TuneIn at MSVS Stereo. One S in the middle. So it's MSV Stereo. Mm. Um, so you can find us on Tune It In as well if you want to listen to us. Um, so yes, the radio station is also part of the not-for-profit organization. So we're not making money out of that. 
We also need our listeners, you know, to pay for advertisements for us to run it. Um, all our um, presenters are doing it for free. And the whole aim of the radio station is to reach more people to tell them about what's happening. Even, you know, like we said, the white South Africans that doesn't want to hear, they don't read the news. So we want to tell the real news in South Africa. We want to say what is really happening because... We, we don't find it anywhere else. No. So, yes, we've also got a website called is www.millionfirsteve.co.za. Um, so you can find us on Twitter. We've got a Twitter handle, at millionfirsteve. So we're all over the place. Um, if, you, if you Google Steve Hofmeyer, you will also find us somewhere there in Google's results. So, um, yes, we we out there. We want to do a lot. We we need you guys to also spread the word, word out there. You can contact me personally at amor, A-M-O-R, at M-S-V-S, T E R E O M S V stereo dot c o dot z a um so yes that's as as Corin Amor I greatly admire what you are doing and it is very very necessary it the 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 really last thing that I'm going to be able to fit in is the importance of all the splinter groups joining hands because there are too few whites in South Africa for us to fight about who's Afrikaans who's a Boer who's English, who we don't Absolutely. like, and um, we don't like one point in your manifesto, so we're not joining with you. We will never get anywhere, and we will never save South Africa unless we forget about those little differences and all stand together. Absolutely, Absolutely. and we are very open about that, Corin. We said anybody can be part of us. Um, you don't have to call yourself an Afrikaner, a boor, or whatever. You don't have to be Afrikaans. You can be English. As long as you want what we want, and that's fairness, and that's safety for our own people, you are more than welcome to join us. So that I agree with you. Let's take hands, and not just hands in South Africa, but also in the world. And, and let's make South Africa a safe place again. Absolutely, Amor, because we cannot do it with all these silly and petty differences. There, there are too few whites in South Africa to be able to do anything for yourselves unless we all stand together and do it together. And if there's anything that you like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I just maybe just want to put it in context that the small amount of people we have about 52 million people that we know of in South Africa of which only four and a half million is white. So you can see we're a very, very small group in South Africa. We are by far the minority in South Africa. Um, and the interesting thing was 21 years ago, we were about six million pe white people and about 12 million black people. So you can see in the last 21 years how the black population has exploded and how the white population has decreased and it's because of what i really believe in the genocide against us yes and and if people do not want to accept that there is a genocide i suggest that they visit the page for genocide watch which is an international concern very very liberal left leaning who have sent people to south africa and who have said that white south africans are on stage six of a of eight stages of genocide, yeah. seven being full-blown happening. So if, a, yeah. if an international, well-respected organization calls it a, a, a slow genocide, about to happen genocide, then nobody can argue with that word when we use it. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, we, we really have a lot of people inside South Africa that that finds it funny that we call it a genocide because they cannot understand how dare we say it's a genocide. They don't want to admit it. 
Um, and it's white people who, who don't want to admit it. So I also always say to them, go and read on that website because there it is in black and white. It's not me saying it. It's not a specific group in South Africa that it's saying it. It's an international organization that says it. So you can believe it. It's, it's not a myth. It's not just a, a scare tactics from our side. It's the reality that we, we're facing. Absolutely. And although... Um, Dr. Gregory Stanton did say he's not saying there is a genocide happening in South Africa. It is a warning that we are there. And he himself yes. said that South Africans must not give up their, their firearms because Julius Malema is the biggest danger facing white South Africans. Absolutely. We haven't even really spoken about him tonight. Um, and I think that is a show on its own. But yes, I mean, sure. Julius Maleva just this week again said that he's tired of the white supremacy in South Africa. Now, after what we've talked about today, I think you sure can agree we do not have white supremacy in South Africa. Not at all. And yet he's the one who said all whites must vote. We've come yeah. to the end of the show, Amor. Thank you very, very much. I hope to have you on again soon because, as you say, we haven't touched on a lot of things that we could talk about. Thank you so much. God Thank you so much, Karen, for having me. God bless South Africa. God bless USA. God help the world that we live in.